Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, Andy, we have a guest. We do. Nin is back. Nin is back. Yes. Hi, Nin. Hello. Sorry, I didn't mean to come. So special. Really high on the intro. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to last week's show and I was really like low on the high of Welcome to Offscript, so I wanted to come in loud this week. Uh, Nin is back from episode 152 when you reviewed Candyman with us. Uh, how have you been? You, you were good. just saying it's been a long time since August, right? I mean, my it gosh. It has been a long time since August. A, a lifetime. Uh, you've watched both movies this week, X and Deep Water. I did. Which I don't know if that's a first for off script guests. You're definitely a return guest, which doesn't happen often. Friend of the it's show, true. I think, officially. We'll it's send you a shirt. Special. And uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> And, and yeah, you're going to hang out for both movies. Also, we're going to do some Oscar predictions in between X and Deep Water. And uh, we first, of course, we got to get to the news. That's that's the first thing always. Our first story this week. Uh, here it is. Uh, Euphoria, Sydney Sweeney is going to co-star opposite Dakota Johnson and Sony's Madam Web. Uh, this came up really early uh, last week, and I found it and thought it was interesting, not because of the success of Euphoria, Sydney Sweeney, great for her, not because Dakota Johnson is sliding into a Sony Marvel movie, good for her, uh, because Madam Web is the next Mar- Sony villain Spider-Man movie after Morbius, I guess, um, and I think that's kind of exciting. And- I don't, I don't know, know about Madam Web. I don't know a ton. All, all I know, she she's kind of a background villain. Like she's uh, cause, cause she's like a spider person, but she's like trapped in this house. She can't. Well, she's leave. yeah, she's in but she's evil. moving the she's moving the pieces. She's like a behind the scenes bad actor. Yeah, uh, here it says in the comics, Madam Web is depicted as an elderly woman with uh, a, some kind of crippling disease, and she's connected to a life support system that looks like a spider web. Due to her age and medical condition, Madam Web never actively fought any villains. It's a weird pick for a cinematic villain. Uh, but this is coming hot off the heels of Venom and assumedly Morbius, right? So I don't think it's a bad move. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> like It could work. I, I think the villain sounds lame, but like I, I think they got good stars. I mean, the, the Spider-Man franchise, anything Spider is like gold now, so I'm sure it'll It'll be fine. I mean, it's going to be like, I think Mo- just like Morbius will be fine. Yeah. Oh, I uh, that. <laughs> well, it's weird. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know how much you know about this. So like there's, there's some, there's some people out there saying Morbius might be a bit of a mid tier hit, which like in, you know, comic book land is basically a success. Uh, yeah. And, and, and coming off of Spider-Man, no way home and uncharted, it seems like Sony might be, I don't know. They they might be they might be pushing Morbius into like a good spot somehow. I, 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 do you have any interest in that movie at all? Not really. Like I do like. So my introduction to Spider Man was the '90s animated series, which yeah. I really <laughs> loved, and uh, like Morbius a lot in that. But I also really don't like Jared Leto. So already I'm yeah, starting yeah, low. You'll fit Plus, right in here. <laughs> there's yeah. like one scene in the trailer where he talks about like some sort of bat radar and it's just like, do you mean sonar? <laughs> like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're a doctor. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. Oh, I on, noticed man. that in the last time I saw the, the trailer, um, the new cut of whatever trailer they've got, because they've got eight different versions of it. They're promoting it for like a year and a half. Oh, yeah. He says, I've got some form of bat radar, which is like such a marketing like gimmick. Like <laughs> just every like, time. Just like, oh. Yes, because it sounds cooler than sonar. Like just, just yeah. Like you can sonar feel already sounds sonar? cool. Yeah, it. like why'd you have to ruin it? It's, well, it sounds cool to nerds, and they don't need nerds to go see this movie. They need like families and teens to go see this movie, right? Like that's they, they, they're trying to draw big crowds. People don't know what sonar means, but bat radar that means something. Yeah, Morb- Morbius. Morbius looks a little. It looks a little cheese, and I, I wonder. I guess Madam Web will probably be made in a similar kind of style right like i think venom and morbius seem like they both have this gravitas of like diet marvel right almost marvel but not quite um i hope this one gets better treatment because i I don't know if it's going to work for morbius uh our next story amazon officially buys mgm which is weird uh 8.5 billion (laughs) dollars this was announced last may um but this is like i think officially closed like this is happening uh you know that this is not any kind of what do you got monopoly i guess uh so that's a big deal a lot a lot of properties that get handed over uh get into mgm first off general impressions gang what do you what do you think uh what, well some of the big properties are that are going there are rocky uh, the rocky creed franchise along with silence of the lambs things like thelma thelma and louise and the handmaid's tale uh the big one the big fish is the james bond franchise is going 
uh, to Amazon Primer will be owned. Not completely. It's still partially owned by Eon Productions out of uh which is like an Italian uh, part over. They actually, I think, have majority say because they won't allow James Bond to be exist in like TV form, on, like film only. Um, but still, th- we're probably going to get all those movies on uh, Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, additionally, I, I, I mean, I have to feel like there's going to be a lot of streaming potential here. Like you just bought a ton of properties, right? So they're going to be yeah. looking to adapt things and streaming shows. Uh, I mean... I guess, I guess they wouldn't do young James Bond, but like it seems like a real layup or some kind of spinoff, right? Like they they've never really got into that in that franchise. Nobody really messes with the James Bond franchise, thanks to the Broccoli family and how they kind of hang on to those. Pearl clutching, uh, as as it were. Uh, so so I don't know. Yeah, it's like a James it's, Bond origin story. It, right. That I think that would be cool. Um, but but we'll see. It's like young Indiana Jones, right? Like same kind of same same kind of same kind of vibe. Um, well, there's also a lot of go, go ahead. Amy. Well, I was going to say we're, we're probably going to be seeing some sort of either like film reboots or TV series. You know, you don't buy these properties without putting them to work. No, and I mean getting getting a hold of sh- TV shows like The Handmaid's Tale and Survivor are really big deals. I mean Survivor's got a ton of content like that you can archive and back up on your streaming service. Go watch all the old seasons of Survivor. Like, I, I mean, b- big deal, obviously, point five billion dollars worth. But I'm really, I'm, I'm really curious to see where they go with James Bond. I, I think, I think those are those are the big hitters, right? People really want to know like what's next for that franchise. Um, the last film kind of left things up in the air a little bit. It seems like Amazon's going to have to decide what what new Bond means. Bondverse. Bond. I still verse. haven't seen that. I, oh, have you not? I, how many no. of the Craig films did you see? We actually, my husband and I actually watched all of them because we were going to watch the new one when it came <laughs> out, and then it was pushed back, and then we never got around. Yeah, to it. just just sore <laughs> on it. Well, you should you should go see it. It's not it's not bad. I think it's. it's I haven't I seen know. Spectre. Uh, Which leads I, I, right I into tried. this, so like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of hurts. I have Spectre on Blu-ray. I've never, I've never indulged and got through the whole thing. I need to sit down and just watch it, but I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, more, more on Amazon in the future. I, I don't think this is going to be anything that goes through immediately. This is probably going to take at least six months to a year before we start seeing these things like appear in their in their category and in, in their uh, in their streaming service. I think. And Andy, do you actually know? Do you? I, I, no, I haven't heard any kind of. Well, while I'm out here making bold claims, yeah. yeah. Matter, but, but I mean, you yeah. got to move. You got to move quick. I mean, con- the, that's true. But these things content. take time, Andy. Yeah, yeah, you need content for these streaming services, and so I'm, I'm sure they're going to hit the ground running. Yeah, Amazon's really excited to get going on this. Uh, one more story this week before we get to our first film uh, from the box office. Batman is still killing it, which is uh, still a little surprising to me, despite having seen the movie. Batman's doing great. Made another thirty-six million last weekend. Andy, what's going on at the box office? Well, Batman has benefited from zero competition. So we know the second week after the Batman came out, there were no new theatrical releases, and this week's theatrical release was x basically and then i think maybe you know i'm sure some other small but no other kind of big contenders uh so it's just mopping up the box office yeah uh the batman is doing fantastic due to its uh demographics obviously like it's it's slanted a bit towards male audiences but i think a lot of people want to know what's going on with new batman and you know bat battinson is is exciting and people want to get in on that and additionally like andy said yeah there's nothing else coming out it's a bummer turning red came out a couple weeks ago and could have come out in theaters and it didn't i feel like that might have given this a bit of a hit additionally x is uh you know we'll get into it in a second here but uh obviously slanted a little bit more towards a, a niche audience than just kind of batman so I, you know good good for batman shoot i guess they're gonna make a bunch i hope they make a million more you know i, I hope they keep making batman forever and then, then you've seen batman right i have uh, uh I, like I mean yeah are you are you surprised at how 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 it just seems I'm, i guess i'm surprised at how it seems you're doing well like just consistently i'm glad it did well initially but yeah it's, it's just it's breaking out here it's a white yeah, horse I, don't, I mean i guess you can cash in on batman and fanboys and robert patterson fangirls yeah so. <laughs> there's always there's always them yeah additionally uncharted's doing okay and this other movie that, that neither andy and i have seen uh jujutsu kaisen zero uh as an anime film yeah. based on a series either of you know anything about it i just know that it was actually pretty big took in 17 million over the weekend uh Dang. so there's strong uh so strong demand for anime film notice none of these show up at the academy awards weird right 
It's weird. None of those show up in best animated film of the year, but it's it's just another, I don't know, <laughs> just, just another year in Hollywood. Uh, so yeah, that's what's going on at the box office. Keep it on off script for more. With that, I should probably slide into our first review. Uh, I'm going to be taking the summary on this one, so please excuse my clumsy delivery. The movie is X. So X is a 1970s grindhouse sort of film. Uh, It takes place in 1979, just outside of Houston, Texas, when a young group of filmmakers travels uh, out to the rural countryside to film a porno. Uh, And when they get out there and and stay at their lodging, they find out that they're elderly uh, kind of caretakers for the weekend, don't actually know what they're up to. And come nightfall, uh, a bloodbath ensues. Uh, the movie stars Mia Goth, Brittany Snow, Jenna Ortega, and is directed by Ty West, uh, who former horror director who's directed such things as The House of the Devil or, um, oh my gosh, Cabin Fever 2. Uh, it is produced by A24 and Agbo. It is a really interesting indie film, uh, and I'm excited to talk about it. Andy and I went and saw it together, and then you've seen it as well. So I want to I, I want to make sure we get everybody's hot takes. Uh, but first off, Andy, what did you think of X? Uh, I really enjoyed it. I, it was a lot of fun. It, it was uh, it was a great line where one of the the guy who who's like filming everything is saying, you know, just because we're making uh, smut doesn't mean we can't make a, a great film or make great cinema. And that's <laughs> kind of a, a summary of, of this film that it's, it's this kind of grindhouse a tribute to slashers of the seventies and eighties, but it's much more polished in, in a lot of ways. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's properly scary in a lot of places. Um, we got, a, you get a lot of throwbacks to, to other horror films and uh, I really enjoyed it overall and yeah get into it uh then what do you think oh i really enjoyed it too it definitely felt a lot like it was paying huge homage to texas chainsaw massacre because there's a lot of shots that resembled it like even i sent you when the trailer came out the all in the van and the shots were kind of similar right right but yeah uh, sorry I, I i'm i'm in the same boat i thought this movie was really good uh really good actually much better than i thought it was going to be uh i definitely tried to go in fresh um the more the longer we've done this podcast the more the more movies we go see the more i try to feel like i, I will watch trailer once and not watch it again and that was the case with x i knew it was coming i kind of had an idea what it was about but i was like i don't want to know any imagery going in i don't want to have thoughts in my head of what the killer might look like i'm just going to go in and kind of uncover the mystery and X does a really good job of kind of opening this wonderful little storybook of a horror film up to you <laughs> and presenting this great little like hour and 16, like what what is it? Like 146 minutes. It's pretty yeah. quick. Like, a little over 90 minutes. Just one of a little picture that just opens and closes in this great little loop. Every, every, every situation it presents, it closes every opportunity, it, every door opened, closed, like, it's a very nice, tight, well-directed, well-scripted, well-put-together horror film, uh, and I'm really excited to talk about it because I think it's really good. Um, so where do we get started? I, I think probably in our setting. Uh, we are in Countryside, Texas in 1979, like Nin said. Big Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibes, especially in just the general plot of the film. Yes, our group of young, horny teenagers arrives at <laughs> a shack out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Uh, and really awful things happens to them. Like it, it's got film grain. Uh, it's a lot of it is shot in four by three, even though most of it's widescreen. Uh, fortunately, it, it's 100% a nostalgic throwback to the days of yore and the films of old and then movies by Toby Hooper. Uh, really, really stylistic throwback to old films, which I think is interesting. Uh, Because it's, you know, reminiscent of older horror without necessarily being some kind of like requel, sequel, prequel thing that seems to be so popular in the genre now. It's an A24 film and it feels like it. Yeah, we yeah, we we have much more interesting characters. We have good actors uh, playing our, our, you know porn stars and and filmmakers uh and, you know they have big dreams they're all in this you know they're in this van all trying to to make it big and you know we're gonna make an adult film. we're gonna be and stars it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Right. uh it reminded me a lot of Bo- boogie nights a little bit um yeah. and, and like me the main character uh one of the main characters uh played by mia goth uh maxine you know she has like these motivational speech moments where she's like talking to herself in the marriage she says something like you will not accept a life you did you did not deserve or something like that <laughs> you know like they're they're really they see themselves as you know that they're gonna make it big and this is like their one chance and they're, they're gonna make this grindhouse 
you know, porn, <laughs> porno out, out in the woods. And it's going to be huge. It's called The Farmer's Daughter. So you get a movie within a movie, which is a, a clever thing. Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Nin, what do you think? It's definitely, it's like you said, reminiscent of like older horror movies and like 70s exploitation films. And I really liked how there was like the shots where they're doing the movie in the movie, but they show you like the movie clip and it's actually like grainier looking. Right. Even, like the old porno movies. And uh, so you mentioned the house of the devil. Uh, Ty West actually shot that in 16 millimeters so that it was just like eighties films. So I'm not sure if he did similar things here with that. Yeah. He's, he's definitely got an appreciation for the genre for sure. It's an industry he's been, it's, it's, it's a, it's an area he's been working in for a long time and I'm not really familiar with his work. I don't know if I've actually ever seen a Ty West movie proper. Like I don't, I don't think I have, um, I've heard of him before. Um, not just cause he has a particularly memorable name, but because of his work. And so this was my first opportunity to really jump in and get into it. Um, I like this movie features a small cast. Uh, it's headed up by Mia Goth, uh, Jenna Ortega and Brittany Snow. It also features uh, Scott Mascuti, or if you don't know him by his stage name, Kid Cuddy, who, uh, is super good in this movie, who I didn't think would be like outstanding. Uh, also a man named Martin Henderson and Stephen Yuri. <laughs> Uh, two gentlemen who I'm not familiar with, but are also really good. Very small cast, very well directed. Everybody's got a good part to play and they all play kind of these generic <laughs> versions of, uh, you know, kind of kind of a small adult film crew in the 1970s. It sounds silly, but hear me out. You've got your director who's kind of organizing the whole thing. You've got your, your young CD cameraman named RJ who wants to make <laughs> movies like they make in France. Yeah, who, they're very obviously a, 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 a tip gonna, of the hat to the audience. He's an A24 of this porn film. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He's just because, yeah, like Andy said, just because it's a dirty movie doesn't mean it ha doesn't have to be great cinema. Uh, you've got his assistant, who's his girlfriend, played by a, a, a young doe-eyed Jenna, Jenna Ortega. Uh, gosh, and, you, and then you got the two. Oh, you, you got a, you got a couple other kind of more seasoned porn stars, uh, plays by Brittany Snow and, and Kid Cudi. And you got uh, you got the two you got the two old, older caretakers at the house where they arrive. Uh, yeah, but who are let's just, get into that just creepy bit. looking. <laughs> My God, yeah. Can we talk about them for a second? Yes, when I, you get uh, yeah, the go ahead then. I was gonna say I don't know how old they're supposed to be exactly. Three hundred, <laughs> like <decrepit>. yeah, a million. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we have we get to this remote farm and uh, you know it's kind of like they they have a barn that's kind of like a bed and breakfast. They have several rooms uh, there, but they get there. And and as soon as soon as the, he knocks on the door, you know, guns put in his face. Who are you? What are you doing here? Are you from the county? I'll shoot you in the face. Uh, and so we get a lot of tension. Like right away, there's been a, a little bit of a mistake. And then, you know, the guy's like, no, I, I've called ahead. You know, you, you you have a place to rent. We're here to, you know, it's like, so there's some confusion there. But they, uh, you know, they sort it out. But this couple is so weird. And we never see them for like the first half of the movie. You don't really get a good look at them. You see them, their faces covered in shadow half the time or at a really far distance. And you see his, his wife, Pearl, like peering out of a window from the second floor. Like you're like, is she there? Is she not there? It looks like there's a ghost. Um, it's like the whole setting is so creepy. And, and like, we all know what the, what's going to happen, but it's still, it does a great job of establishing this really, you know, un, uneasy mood. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I definitely found myself wondering, like, where's where's the danger going to come from, right? Because it's it's uh, honestly almost the, the film is almost split into two parts. Like the first half of it is pretty innocent. I mean, it's it's spicy for I mean, sure. They're, they're making, making a this, porno. This, this, yeah, they're making a porno, <laughs> but like it's not bloody yet. Like, but it, there's there's so much creep and so much good setup and like as the film kind of goes on you like and as the sun kind of goes down on this this evening in texas uh it just starts to get a little eerier you know and the, the soundtrack kind of brings it down a little bit and, and before you know it night's fallen and uh bad things are happening but like andy said you don't get to look at our caretakers and it, and it keeps them very mysterious because you don't know what the hell's going on with them it's like well something's wrong with them but i can't even i can't even really see their faces all that well it's a it's a it's a good good choice in staging and lighting and direction to keep them kind of in shadow a little bit. Cause they seem like they'd be harmless, right? There's just a couple of old people in Texas. <laughs> How bad could they be? Um, but come to find out like that, that may, may not be all that's happening on this farm. And there may be, maybe more born to it than meets the eye. Uh, Nin, any thoughts on our, 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 our cast? I don't know. What do you think of them? Oh, Including... I really love the cast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was surprised that, 
well, I guess one of the cast members is actually has two roles in the film. Yeah, I was surprised by that as well. <laughs> I was also <laughs> did not did not know that going in. That was a surprise. And yeah. I was going to mention we we get to know our our old people a little a little bit more than I think the average movie and it and it turns out uh, like Pearl used to be kind of a dancer she used to be this beautiful beautiful young woman and and her husband would do like you know they met in like the first world war and he would do anything for her and uh, they both kind of have this longing of youth and they're somewhat jealous of the these group of, of young people who have arrived and have all that youth that they wish they still had yeah, and it's also like the, the the movie's kind of in I don't know part part of its theme is is kind of like the introduction of of the new and like technology, right? Like on the one hand, our our, our house out in Texas, our small town nowhere, is like decrepit and old and rotting, and the people there are old and they they have lived their lives and they are towards the end, right? And like their old tube TV is running black and white sermons of 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 talking about God fear and Christians and whatnot. Meanwhile, like our main cast is like shooting a shooting a tape for like the VHS boom because like home video is just starting to become a thing. And they're like, hey, we're going to make this thing and we can just put it out there and anybody can find it. Like, it's amazing. Yeah, they got a camera. Yeah. Home. And they're, they're, they're making things that are new and different and exciting. And everybody there is young and they're, they look great. Right. Like, because they're, they're adult film stars mostly. And, and they, they all look attractive and they, they all like represent this like vigor of youth and, and uh, our, our old folks who are a bit more conservative uh, are not, not so much into that. It seems uh, once, once they kind of get to know their, their new residents. Yeah. Like one of the biggest themes seems to be, I guess, aging or the horrors of aging <laughs> and being yeah. forgotten. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that, that's one of the things that I like about this movie that I was looking forward to because I was like, I'm sure it's gonna we're gonna have horror stuff, but like, what is it gonna be about? What are some of the th- the themes? And that's like this uh, idea of aging and youth or or lost youth, no longer having youth, and old versus versus young. It's and it's not a, t- a ton because it's you know it's a fun hundred minute film, um, but there's just enough. Uh, in there between our old couple and our and our group of young young friends and even just kind of even some some fighting uh infighting am- amongst the the group the like ty west does a lot with just small amounts of dialogue yeah um and 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 good scripting yeah and that's 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 the next thing i want to get into perfect segue uh the script is so tight it feels like every joke has a punchline and every mm-hmm. every payoff had a setup whether you remember it or not like mm-hmm. since we watched it um, we've been kind of comparing notes, uh, and it comes it comes turn, turns out like there's a lot of hints towards setups later in the film, early in the dialogue that like you may you will likely miss first time around. So it's it's smartly written. It's also funny. Um, this is a very funny. It's really movie. funny. Yeah, like <laughs> outside of the horror and and kind of these larger themes, there are like very intentional laughs in the movie. Like some of it might seem small or like something maybe insignificant. Uh, like uh, like an adult film star silhouette in the dark uh, during a oh. particularly scary scene, like yeah. which is like not not yeah right. Nobody's laughing on screen, but like it's very clearly funny, or or just like lines in the script that are like just intentionally laid out to be funny. Um, I laughed a bunch during this movie, which is not not easy to do in most horror films, especially when it gets as serious as it does uh, in in the second and third act. I wasn't really sure about laughing because our theater was so quiet. Like my friend <laughs> laughed and he's like, I don't know if I was supposed to laugh or not, but I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, we definitely had some guy in our theater because uh, we walked in and it was like, <laughs> there weren't many people in our theater. We were wondering how many people were going to be in there. And there was just kind of a smattering of a few people and it was all dudes. And like, well, yeah, at one particular joke, Brittany Snow says something that's, that's particularly crass because she's a porn actress and some guy a few rows behind us like, <laughs> <laughs> I like died in my seat. Like it's <laughs> it's great. So like I'm I'm glad I got to see this with a few other people because I, I think it's definitely something you can enjoy with friends for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's get into the the horror of it all. Let's get into yeah. Let's get, get into, into the, the, the the scare and 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 gore. So so the first half of the, of the film is mostly mood and setup, and there's lots of tension and lots of like this this old couple, particularly the older. The wife Pearl is so creepy, so unsettling. She just kind of is wandering around this this little farm like a ghost. Um, so that's what we have most in the first half, and before the car and it starts. And man, when it starts, it, it goes hard. It's uh, we we get a lot of gross out gore, um, you know, good old 
fashion, like kind of uh, practical effects uh, kind of stuff, uh, you know, stuff that'll make your stomach churn a little bit, but that's what we're here for. Yeah. yeah uh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> there's definitely some good kills there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> some uh surprisingly graphic uh depictions of gore i, I like that's open very early in the film when, when our, our van of uh you know unknown victims is driving along texas landside the landside they uh end up coming coming across a, a cow that was hit by a truck on the side of the road and it's like guts out blood all over and that's that's right warning right in the first act hey this is gonna get real <laughs> real explicit you're gonna you're gonna see some gross stuff we're not we're not getting away from this um which is smart again to set up in the payoff, uh, and and yeah, we, we we do get some pretty pretty exciting. I think I think kills in the second half of the movie. Uh, they definitely come at you quick, which was surprising. It's something something Andy you pointed out after we saw is you is you were and wondering how are they going to keep this group of young, uh, obviously like vibrant individuals from seeing and knowing that that one another are getting murdered, right? Like how 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 are two old people? <laughs> a managed group of like eight young individuals like how, how does that work and the movie's got a really clever way of answering that um it's simple but it works and it does exactly what it needs to do it's a very simple device i won't get into it because i think it's kind of spoiler territory but um it's effective and it gives everybody a bit of a scene it makes it, it no nobody feels like they're wasted it feels like every every member of this cast is used effectively in their role like like pawns in a chessboard uh sorry for the chess bunny i know that's, that's <laughs> thing, but, uh yeah wh what do you think um i I think that one of the things I appreciated is that we didn't have dumb characters. They didn't go off and, and be like, oh, I'm going to go investigate this dark basement by myself. Um, you, everything they do is very plausible. And, you know, they try to do things to to escape the horror. And uh, they also do a good job of, like, not knowing that other people have, you know, be, been off uh, at some point. You know, a lot of times uh it'll be really obvious that someone's been killed and they're like, well, let's stick around and investigate. Um, but like the writing is really tight in that way where it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You're not rolling your eyes at how stupid the characters are. No, I, I think it would have been easy to make it feel kind of goofy and uh, you know, like a little, a little tongue in cheek, like just kind of a goofy slasher horror movie. That's a tribute to older films. Um, but this one goes the extra mile. Like, and it makes it feel relatively plausible. There, there was definitely a couple times when I thought, Okay, this this wouldn't quite work but by that time you're well in the third act and your characters are panicking so it's like yeah. well you know <laughs> yeah your your victims are in full-on panic like yeah okay I, who's to say they didn't hear that over there or they didn't see that thing they should have seen you know like it it kind of it kind of adds up uh, overall i'm surprised at how tight it all wraps up like and and how well it all comes together as just kind of the slice of a feature uh all on its own there's definitely I think some potential for future work in this this kind of film that if you stick around till after the credits you might you might find out more about that but otherwise um I'm I'm just surprised at how well wrapped this whole thing is like it just feels like nowadays in horror movies I don't know everything's got to be a Bloomhouse production right and it's got to have some kind of big gimmick and like it, this movie sequels. feels yeah and this one this one feels just surprisingly simple I, I like the way it just kind of feels like its own its own thing it doesn't have to be but I, I I don't know in a way I hope it is what do, what do you guys think I definitely think it could stand alone on its own like I do like what they're doing with the end credits there yeah <laughs> But Let's even because a bunch of people got up and left, I just I always stick around. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I, it definitely stands on its own. I, I mean, it is a kind of very generic picture. I mean, he could revisit this in 10, 20 years. Um, you know, with like go, going back to the farm where the whatever happened. Uh, you could horror always lends itself to that, but it he doesn't have to. It it stands on its own. It's a fun a fun little movie. Like I said, said it's a kind of thing like you you would have a good time watching this with it with a group of friends. Yeah, I think for sure. Uh, any other thoughts for recommendations gang? I think I'm ready. All right. Yeah. So I don't remember how we did this with candy man, but I think we'll do Andy and then Nin and then me, or do we do Nin and then Andy? And then me? What, how, what, how do you guys want to do this? I'll start. Andy, go <laughs> ahead. 
Uh, I yes, I, I would recommend X. It's a lot of fun. It's good horror. It's it's well written. It's it's properly scary. That like get so creeped out in, in the first half of it. Um, there's a lot of uncomfortable things. Not not just the you know the kills, which are always a lot of fun, but just like the sense of ever looming dread that the bottom's about to fall out, but you don't know exactly when. Um, we get fun characters. We have a little bit of social commentary uh, going on. This kind of thing about progressive relationships in, between men and women, and young and old, and things like that. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Definitely recommend. Nan, what do you think? I also definitely recommend it for anybody that's into horror, especially because it's so nostalgic for classic horror movies. And it was definitely a really fun watch. Um, I'd probably revisit this one again too. Yeah, I, I think I'm in the same boat. Ringing recommendation. I, I think I think X might be top ten of the year material, especially if you're a horror fan. Like you should definitely go see what this movie's doing. It's weird. I, I guess I I feel like I'm used to A24 really campaigning for like films that they're excited about. They've been pushing for Tragedy of Macbeth at the Oscars uh, over my boy The Green Knight, which bums me out. But it uh. it just seems like they they put money into projects they believe in, and I just don't feel like I've seen a lot of attention for this one. And it's weird because it's really good. Um, you should definitely go check out X in a theater if possible. It'll be on streaming, but it won't be as fun. Um, yeah, and keep it here on all script for more from X, I guess. Uh, with that, we got to talk about the Oscars, right? That's right. <laughs> the Oscars are coming next week. Uh, and 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 Andy, I got to know where you're going to watch them. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to because at this point, you either have to have a cable subscription or you got to go to somewhere like a bar and sit for three and a half hours, uh, which is a little bit much to <laughs> to sit and, and watch. And I enjoy watching the show. I used to watch the show every year religiously since like 2020, but now it's just so difficult to watch. I don't really even bother anymore. Nin, where are you, where are you watching them? Are you watching them at all? I've actually never watched the Oscars. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, in, okay. Good. A perspective. Yeah, that we, we we haven't covered on this show before. Never, ever, never once. I don't think so. I mean, you, yeah. I think maybe one of my friends once tried to con me into watching them. <laughs> and... <laughs> I mean, I mean okay, there's, there's, there's nothing about it that's appealing. It's it's three and a half hours at least, and it's long. It's slow. And yes, it is a tribute to cinema and all that. But it's um, you know, I mean, I can I, look it up at the end. Who it's won? Di it's <laughs> difficult. Yeah. Um, um, it's yeah. usually fun because there's there's they usually have some of the live music performances or the way they recap for some of the films. But this has gotten less and less kind of in engaging over the last few years. Yeah, and, and like I think part of what's uh, tough about it is is their their immediate attention to staying on broadcast television. Uh, uh, we've all seen. The red carpet photos the next day or maybe even that evening on Twitter, right? We've seen the hot takes. We, we might see a couple memes and photos immediately, but like you don't see any clips of these things like circling around unless they're like on Twitter because if they go to YouTube, they get they get copyrighted and they get pulled really fast. Like the Oscars are still in this weird spot where they don't want to be on streaming services, but that's how people share your content. So like, if you're not, if you don't make it readily available, people, won't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, regardless, if, you know, yeah. if they had even a pay-per-view option, I would probably do it just for the show. So we could, you know, I'd make a thing yeah. out of it. You could have a little party. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, Oscars are done by ABC, but, right? That's but you can't, Disney plus. You can't, I mean, you can't buy like a yeah. one-off. It's weird. Cause like it didn't the BAFTAs, I think the BAFTAs just ran on HBO. And they literally had like a streaming event for the evening. It was like their front page, like the BAFTAs or whatever. Maybe it was a Critics' Choice Awards. I don't recall. It's one of them. They had a whole thing. They had like a promo made up for it. I mean, they didn't like heavily advertise it. But if you wanted to watch it, you just go to HBO Max or whatever you got. And there it is. And you can play it and watch it. Um, it's frustrating that's not that way with the Oscars. But regardless, there's a lot of exciting picks on the noms this year. We're not going to read all of them. We're just going to read like the five or six big ones, you know, because we, we look, it could it could take a long time. And clearly, the Oscars isn't, uh, you know, they're not they're not too big on doing these all on screen. They've already talked about kicking some to off screen. So let's get into it. <laughs> uh andy you want to you want to start this thing yeah I'll, I'll kick this off and i'll I'll, uh, I'll choose what i think they're gonna pick and then what what i would pick so our big category best picture there are i think a full 10 pick, movies uh which are belfast coda don't look up drive my car dune king richard licorice pizza nightmare alley the power of the dog and west side story um of those i think the big money is on the power of the dog uh directed by jane, jane campion the western that we did review a few episodes back my favorite among this list is definitely dune 
uh i think i'm in the same boat i think power of the dog's gonna win uh my favorite to win wait hold on hold on wait okay let me rephrase this i think i think my favorite to win is probably gonna be i think they're gonna pick west side story because i don't want to just say power of the dog so i'm gonna say hey steven spielberg picture big musical old hollywood people love that stuff maybe west side story the one i'd like to win is probably doom but i don't i don't think doom will win uh then have you seen many of these yeah i saw dune and nightmare alley and i think that was it <laughs> i haven't features i haven't seen a lot of these like these like i i couldn't find belfast if i wanted to um because it it's like a seven dollar rental still uh but i've heard right. good things uh coda i've heard a lot of good things about zach you've seen drive my car I have by, by the way, drive my car on HBO Max. You should still watch it, Andy. Big, right. big well, ring in the well, When I have three hours to sit there. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I did watch Don't hours. Look Up also. Yes. Um, Andy, why do you think... Well, hold on. Then. We, 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 do you actually have a pick? I, I, I don't know. Anything you've heard? I don't do you have any think theories? I really saw enough to... <laughs> all right. All right. That's fair. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, you don't have to... Yeah, Andy, why do you think Dune isn't going to win? If it's both of our favorites... Why doesn't your favorite win the Oscar? Well, because it's a big like spectacle film and, you know, it's a big sci-fi production. It, it's kind of lacking the depth, you know, the kind of seriousness that Oscar films usually have. Usually, you know, you're looking for very intense characters or, or deep plot, deep and philosophical plots. And it doesn't really have that. The power of the dog is right up there. Um, it's a struggle to get through that, that movie <laughs> you talked about, but it's uh, the kind of movie that, that wins. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. It's it's the kind of pomp that I think like the Academy Awards like. Remember, uh, the Academy Awards don't always pick the best film in time. They pick the best film of the year. People often, often reminded of like the artist in what was that twenty eleven? Yeah, that one like it's, it's fine movie, right? But like nobody remembers the artist. There's not a lot of cultural value in that. <laughs> so you know that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, it'd be great if Dune won. I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, next up, actor in a leading role. Um, I would say I'm ashamed at how few of these I've seen, uh, but I'm really ashamed of how how few of the actress in leading role movies I've seen. So we'll get to that in a minute. But for actor in leading role, uh, our nominees are Javier Bardem and Being the Ricardos, Benedict Cumberbatch in The Power of the Dog, Andrew Garfield and Tick Tick Boom, Will Smith and King Richard, and Denzel Washington in The Tragedy of Macbeth. I think the one that's probably going to win... Dude, I don't know. Andy, what do you think is going to um, I mean, I, I've heard, a, again, I've heard a lot of, The Power of the Dog has like 11 nominations. So that, that I, I think know. that's kind of the front runner. But I've also heard that Javier Bardem is very good in, in being the Rick, Ricardos, as well as the Andrew Garfield in Tick, Tick, Boom. At the same time, Will Smith could win because he's Will Smith. But I, I, I wasn't a huge fan of King, whoa, King, King Richard. Whoa, what value does that have now? Because he's Will Smith, that mattered in 2013, like when he couldn't stop putting out bangers. Like, it's been a minute. And maybe he would win just because, you know, like it's been a while and people love a good comeback story. But I don't, he's, he's pretty good in King Richard. He's not bad. Like, he, he, it's a he's fine right. performance. I would come back worthy. Yeah, yeah. I, I would pick Denzel Washington <laughs> over him. Uh, for this, but yeah, it, it, I I don't really I don't really know. Then thoughts? I haven't seen it, any of these. <laughs> like Tick Tick <laughs> okay. is on my watch list. Yeah, I know. Me too. I, I need to go check that out. Yeah, it's probably going to be better. Cumberbatch and in, in the Power of the Dog. To be fair, he he is very good in that movie, and he is a large part of why it works. His character is pivotal to that movie working and functioning for what it is. So. I think he's good in it. I'd love to see Andrew Garfield win. I haven't seen Tick, Tick, Boom, but like, I don't know. I like Andrew Garfield. And hey, if the Oscars are talking about getting younger people to watch, that'd be a great start. Uh, Andy, what's next? Uh, let's do actor in a, a supporting role. Uh, this one might be a little bit more clear cut. We have uh, uh, Saron Hines in Belfast, Troy Kotzer from Coda, Jesse Plemons in The Power of the Dog, J.K. Simmons in Being the Ricardos, and Cody Smith McPhee in also from The Power of the Dog. So two supporting actors from The Power of the Dog, which is really surprising because Jesse Plemons is kind of absent from the movie, and he just kind of, I don't know, he, he's got a very kind of, he's just kind of a wooden guy, so I'm not real sure how that happened. Uh, the big one here, favorite, is probably Troy Kotzer from coda who's won a lot of awards and he's a big deal because uh he's one of the first i think he's one of the first uh he's deaf or partially deaf um disabled people to win an award so it would be huge if he won so he's kind of a front runner for that 
definitely reminds me of when I forget the I forget the actor's name. There was an actor from uh, Sound of Metal from last year. Riz Ahmed. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, it was it was uh, one of the guys who oh. played opposite him, who I think is actually deaf, uh, who got nominated for a few things, but like didn't win anything. I don't think he, I don't think anything really took off. But similar vibes. Uh, I, I I haven't seen Coda, but I hear that character uh, that, that Troy plays. I think he plays the father. I hear he's very funny. And and people have told me he's he's hilarious in it, and you wouldn't think a deaf person would be funny, but like that's part of why his performance works so well. So I don't know, I, I, that might be rad. I, I, out of these, yeah, it's probably going to be something. Statistically, it's probably going to be something from Power of the Dog uh, that's got the biggest shot here. I'd love for Cody Smith McPhee to win. Yeah, Jesse Plemons is a weird pick, and unfortunately, I haven't seen the other films, so it's 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 a tough. <laughs> I saw it's a great. tough bag. I saw a great thing earlier that Cody Smith McPhee is just he he's like a skinnier, paler even weirder name than benedict cumberbatch right and and in a weird way that's why he plays so perfect in that movie um yeah uh nin input what do you think yeah again i haven't seen a lot of these shows. <laughs> it's okay it's okay I, I don't mind that i feel like we've only seen like half of these because they're like, i know like yeah, I, I, say, I, if you've Andy, only seen half i've seen less <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Andy, we're going to start getting into categories for stuff we've seen, and unfortunately, that does not include this next one, actress in the leading <laughs> role, like I said. I'm ashamed of how few of these we've seen. Uh, the, the nominees are Jessica Chastain in The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Olivia Coleman in The Lost Daughter, Penelope Cruz in Parallel Mothers, Nicole Kidman in Being the Ricardos, and Kristen Stewart in Spencer. Uh, the one I'd like to see taken has got to be Kristen Stewart. I, I would love for her to win an Oscar. I think she, I, I genuinely think she's pretty good. And like, I feel like she still has some of that trappings of Twilight that Robert Pattinson is still kind of trapped in, even with Batman. Like, um, she, but like the last few movies I've seen her in, she's been really good and, and she consistently is putting out solid performances. So I hear she's great in that movie. I hear it's very good. Um, yeah. And the only one I've seen is Olivia Coleman in The Lost Daughter, who is fine. Like, I think she is fine in that movie, but I also thought it was just a fine movie. So uh, maybe I'm not the best pick for yeah. it. I mean, Andy, I, what, do, what do you think? I thought she, I mean, I did think Olivia Coleman was very good in The Lost Daughter. That movie was also kind of a struggle to get through. Um, I've heard great things about Jessica Chastain in the eyes of Tammy Faye. I've heard it's not a very good movie or it's just kind of mediocre. I know it's movie, on HBO but, right now. Yeah, you can check it out there. But I've heard that her performance is really stellar. I haven't seen Parallel Mothers. That's a Pedro Almodovar uh, Spanish language film. Um, Nicole Kidman just seems like she's trying to get an Oscar and she doesn't look like look or sound like Lucille Ball at all. And it's it's a pandering role in pandering film. And I refuse to support it. Wow. Um, wow. You haven't even seen it. Oh my God. All right. That's Kristen fine. Stewart. Uh, I've, I've heard is, is really good as Pristana yeah. and I've heard that, that Spencer is, is a good movie as well. So this is another category that's really hard to call. I think I would have to say Olivia Coleman only cause that's the one I've seen. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, next, well, hold on. Nin, any thoughts? Yeah. I haven't seen any of these. <laughs> okay. That's fair. That's all right. I look, I want to make sure look, but, look, you're guest on the show, your friend of the show. You're going to be included. All right. Like it, it, we're going to do it. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Very yeah. appreciate it. it would yeah, be, of course. I guess I want to see Kristen Stewart censor. I haven't, mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen trailers for any of that, but the only other things I know her from is like Charlie angels and American ultra. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I was going to say the last couple movies I saw of her, she did underwater for 20th century Fox, which they shot in 2019, which she was super good in, even though nobody went and saw it. Um, and then also, uh, God, what was that Christmas movie uh, with her and Mackenzie Davis? It's got a really oh, simple name. I know. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I did watched watch it again. that one. I watched it again last <laughs> December with Christine. Still a good watch. Like, she's great in that movie, too. Like, for what it's worth, she's like she's turning out good performances. I think her movies just haven't been really, um, you know, big, big blockbuster endeavors. So, like, I, I, I hope she has some luck here. Andy, you want to jump around? You want to pick up any more of these categories? Where, how, how are you uh, feeling? Uh, let's do a couple more. Let's do uh, supporting actress, supporting role, and, and director. Um, this, this, this one's actually a little bit more uh, familiar. Actress in supporting role, Jesse Buckley in the, the Lost Daughter. She plays the younger version of Olivia Coleman's character. Ariana DeBose in West Side Story, who played Anita. Uh, an incredible role there. Judy Dench in Belfast, which we haven't seen. <laughs> Kirsten Dunst in The Power of the Dog. That she's like not in the movie half the time. So again, like Jesse Plemons. Oh, hold like, on, I, hold well, on. Like, she's in the movie more than Jesse Plemons is. Like, exactly. what do you mean she's not? She's usually in a third of that film. Like, wait a second. Yeah, yeah a third exactly. <laughs> and then 
uh, Anjane Ellis uh, in King Richard, who plays uh, King Richard's uh, wife. Um, and uh, she's what these are all really solid roles. My pick for this would be Ariana DeBose from West Side Story. She's really phenomenal in that. Yeah, I think. Listen, she's super good in that movie, and I, and I, I know she's really good. Uh, but dude, I really. <laughs> It's gonna sound terrible. I really like Jesse Buckley and Lost Daughter. Um, I really like Jesse Buckley in general. Uh, just just before X, we saw the trailer for A twenty four's Men starring her, uh, and that looks great too. Um, so I, she's got a really neat performance. Uh, she didn't work with Olivia Coleman at all, even they, even though they both play the same character, they both had completely different reads of this individual, um, and she plays a really interesting tortured mother. Uh, that I thought was really good. Although I, I, I would hope Ariana DeBose wins because uh, she's really excellent. I, I think that's probably who they'll pick. I don't know. My, 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 uh, uh, so, so what was, really impress- pick was Jesse Buckley. What was really impressive to me about her role in West side story is that she, she's got to do it all. I think she's already on Broadway. Um, so that t- kind of tells you her level, but like, she's got to do the singing. She's got to do the dancing. She's got to speak Spanish and English and like, flip-flop between both really quickly um yeah it's really she, has to hold, she, she also has to hold up a solid emotional core for yeah like, yeah and uh, and yeah. acting is as well so it's mm-hmm. uh it's a triple threat like she's just phenomenal it's true uh nan have you seen what's that story haven't that is also on my watch list <laughs> okay uh it's on hbo, HBO and disney right. Ma- disney plus right yeah i think yep. either oh. you can see it yeah i, I can think it's on that. both yeah all right i really wanted to hit cinematography let's jump to directing uh our directors for the 2022 oscars are belfast or kenneth Branagh for belfast uh risuke hamaguchi for drive my car uh paul thomas anderson for licorice pizza jane campion for the power of the dog and steven spielberg for west side story i think snubbery i think spielberg's gonna take it that's my pick uh maybe jane campion I, I don't know if Kenneth Brown is going to intro. I, I look, I know Belfast is on here a lot. I feel like to the outsider, you might think, Ooh, black and white, Kenneth Brana, Belfast, the Academy. I love it. And maybe they will, but like, additionally, there's some other really good movies on these lists. It's, I feel <laughs> like it's worth, had no it's Oscar mentioning. buzz. Yeah. Like it, it's, I, I don't know. And I haven't seen it. So it's hard for me to judge, but I just don't, I don't know. I, I don't see that one go in the distance. It's in a lot of categories though, which is great. Yeah, I think the the big the big money is on Jane Campion for the uh, the power of the dog. She's been winning uh, other smaller awards uh, for being the director of that film. I think she's probably going to do it. My runner up for that would probably be Steven Spielberg. Uh, Andy, when you said snub, who did you mean? Did you mean David Our, Lowry for the Green Knight, or, yes. or <laughs> Denis Villeneuve for Dune? Or here, let me scroll up his list. Like find some other. Or people. Julia Dircanal for Titan. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely our boy Danny Villeneuve uh, for Dune because it, it was nominated for best picture and nominated for a n- number of other Oscars, but he was not nominated for uh, best director, which I felt he absolutely should have been. Yeah. Uh, Nin, any picks for director? What do you think? I mean, out of, out of what you've seen this year, any favorites? I don't think I've seen any of the ones listed. Andy scrolled past the only section I've seen, which is animated movies. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Well, hold on. You've seen it. Yeah, let's touch. Yeah, let's touch on. Can that. we? Come on. Yeah. I love. Yeah. I love talking about anime movies. Like I, they're always my, some of my favorite. Uh, well, here and then you've you've seen them. You can see these, right? Why don't you do this list? Shoot. Oh. Maybe you can't see them. Can you see them? I think no, I no, them. I can see them. Yeah. The, yeah. the only one I haven't seen is Flea. Mm. I don't think I've seen. I, I also know. haven't seen Flea. Really heard that. So one. We, so we for the listeners we have Encanto, Flea, Luca. The Mitchells versus the Machines and Ryan the Last Dragon. Of those, uh, I've seen all of them except Flea. And the funny thing, all of, all these are children's movies except for Flea, which I actually think is very serious. Like I think it's about human trafficking. Oh my god! Um, in but in animated form, form it's it's definitely not a kids' film. Uh, heard good things, but heard it's, it's very uh, heavy. Big winners generally going to be Disney. Um, I think it's probably going to be Luca or Encanto. Did Luca uh, have a theatrical release? No, Disney Plus. I think only. that went straight. Yeah, straight to Disney. At least I think it might have been dual. It might have been dual. As far as yeah, I know, it's something like that. Yeah. It wouldn't be on this list if it hadn't. I but. definitely watched it on yeah. Disney Plus. And Encanto and and mostly, yeah. I think, because it's just so recent. Yeah, and then yeah. what do you think is going to take? It's it? Definitely on everybody's minds. Um, yeah, I'd probably have to go with Encanto. 
Same boat. I think Encanto is going to take it. Uh, and it's a great movie. Like, shoot, I'm not like I'm, I'm not going to say it's it's there's anything wrong with it. I, I think out of here, I think it's probably the strongest. See, Mitchell's versus the Machines is interesting, but yeah, Disney's got three hits. I was going to say oh, yeah, sure. th this is the one category where like you may have actually seen every movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except for the human trafficking movie. Except for that one. Yeah. So that's that. That's our, our 2022 Oscar predictions. Uh, as always, we spent too long on it, but that's how the Oscars go. And I'm glad we did, all right, because I like talking about this stuff. The Oscars are fun. And, uh, you know, whether we actually end up getting to watch them next week or just following them on Twitter, we'll oh, keep you apprised on next week's Oscar. Film real video. quick, apparently Flea is also a documentary. Good Lord. All right, we need to see Flea. There's a oh, lot it's, going on. So it's in on, yeah, so it's, it's on Hulu mm. as well. I just looked it up. So, yeah, m maybe we'll catch that. It's 90 Rock minutes. On. All right, well, we've got one more film to talk about before we wrap up this episode. Andy, you want to uh, you know, do the honors? Deep Water. So this is the new film on Hulu, now streaming. Uh, it's an erotic thriller uh, by the king of erotic thrillers, Adrian Lin, uh, who directed that films such as Indecent Proposal and Unfaithful. This is literally his first film in 20 years. Um, it stars Ben Affleck as Vic and Anna Darmus as Melinda. They are uh, Louisiana, New Orleans socialites who are very wealthy and have this this big uh, kind of Southern Gothic house, and uh, they have parties with other friends. They have a very peculiar peculiar uh, I said it wrong both times a <laughs> relationship. <laughs> <laughs> um, where Melinda seems to kind of run around on Ben Affleck. She has these little boyfriends that she's very public with. He, you know, they go to a big party and she like runs off with her, her little boyfriend and everyone sees this. He sees this. Um, and Ben Affleck doesn't seem to mind. He kind of does, but he also lets Melinda do her thing. He says, well, I don't want to control her. She's, she's a free spirit. Uh, but he definitely kind of does have a problem. And But it, it, it's a weird... Uh, dynamic where he's super jealous but at the same time he'll invite her you know her little boyfriends over to their house and, and cook them dinner so you don't really know what's going on it's a very strange relationship that there's a lot of tension between both of them they're constantly p picking at each other uh fighting with with each other they also ha have a three-year-old daughter at one point uh ben affleck's character vic threatens one of her her boyfriends saying you know so and so went missing and you know i was i'm the reason why you don't know if he's serious or if he's kidding and kind of ruffles everyone's feathers but this is kind of our setup that there are these socialites with this really strange relationship uh it's a little, little bit of a relationship drama social drama uh eventually uh an accident befalls one of one of her many lovers and uh, vic is kind of the prime suspect uh so that's our our setup uh, Zach, what do you think? Uh, so Deep Water is a, a straight streaming film. I think in, in in every sense of the word, it's it's okay. I thought this movie was all right. It, it, you know, it's 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 a, a drama thriller about a married couple. There's something deep going on under the surface, right? Which I think is what's supposed to and the title's kind of hinting at. And uh, interestingly, you've got a script by Sam Levinson who wrote uh, you, HBO's Euphoria, Assassination Nation, Malcolm Marie, and you, it's directed by Adrian Lin, who hasn't directed a film in 20 years. It's the first movie since Unfaithful. They also directed Indecent Proposal, Fatal Attraction, Jacob's Ladder, Flashdance, Nine and a Half Weeks. Big, big 90s and 80s, mostly 80s, like dark, romantic thriller movies. So like on paper, this movie should work. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work and and i'm i'm excited to talk about why nin you have seen this movie what do you think i did it was supposed to be an ero erotic thriller and it's not very erotic or very thrilling it's it just kind of falls flat no like it's an erotic sleeper think, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it really is but no it's definitely like I felt like it was kind of trying to build up to something and there's not really, it didn't feel like there was much of a climax. It's just kind of like, oop, we're done now. It's not, yeah. There's not a, a yes. lot of payoff. No. Uh, Andy, where do you want to, I mean, where do you want to jump in on this? Well, I, I need to give my opinion that like, I thought this movie was terrible. I thought it was so bad. So none of it was worse of, than I did. Yeah. None of it worked for me. Like, like Nin said, it wasn't erotic or thrilling. Uh, Ben Affleck ha has the charisma of like a wooden log. Their relationship is, is not super believable on a number uh, of levels. It doesn't make any sense. 
and like I said, at first I thought it was going to be a relationship drama. It's not really that. I thought it was going to be maybe a social drama. It's going to be bet- about their relationships between all their other friends in this kind of wealthy community. It's not about that either. It's about like there's these snails that, oh God, <laughs> that Ben Affleck is like playing with all the time, which I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Um, like I said, th- their relationship doesn't make sense. They're supposed to, there's, you know, some quote unquote steamy scenes, but they're like, they all fall flat as well. Like, this should this should work. Anna Darmus is is fine, but it's just like the story is just all over the place for me. And it was overall, it was just so boring. Yeah, I, I think the core of its problem. I, I told Andy this, and I don't really know if this is the best way to describe it, but I, I feel like this movie like just does not have a pulse. It's like a corpse. Like it's just cold and like unfeeling. Many of its scenes, like our characters, just kind of feel like they're just saying dialogue lines to one another. Like it's like if an alien tried to make Gone Girl. And it feels a lot like Gone Girl, uh, especially with Ben Affleck being here, but also in its presentation, very dark, very blue, similar to how Fincher shot Gone Girl. And it's based on the book by Patricia Highsmith, which apparently Gillian Flynn, the writer of Gone Girl, is a big fan of. Nin told me that before we started the episode. Solid trivia from Nin. Thank you for that. I didn't want you to think I was just uh, stealing your trivia and running with it. Not at all. Uh, So... I think it's like it's supposed to be Gone Girl, but but I think its biggest problem is its director, Adrian Lin, has not made a movie in literally 20 years. The last movie was Unforgettable in 2002. It's now 2022. Unfaithful, I'm sorry, with Richard Gere in 2002. So being away from the director's chair for 20 years, like they just didn't have it. They just didn't. I, I just don't feel like they had the confidence to feel like each, each of their scenes was moving with equivalent pacing and feel like there's like a, a tone and a structure for the audience to follow and just comes off feeling really dry and really cold. Like our, our audience our, our, our it's hard to get an emotional read on, on our, our, our leads. And I think it's supposed to be in, in scenes. I, in certain things, scenes, I thought it was stylistic. And then after talking about it later with Andy, Andy was like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not stylistic. Oh, it's just bad. So. Yeah. There's like zero emotion for what should be like what crimes of passion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that that really bothers me is that their relationship just doesn't make any sense. Like either they're in this open and progressive relationship where, you know, she can see whoever she wants. Um, But then he's like super jealous and clearly not okay with it. And it's like if you're going to be in that you're either in that kind of relationship or you're not. And if you're not okay with it, you're not going to be in like you're going to get divorced. You're not going to be together. Like it doesn't really make uh, any sense. And like he. He's supposed to be jealous and angry, but he's not really that jealous or that angry. And like his his actions don't really make a, a whole lot of sense. Yeah, because he's just like, oh, if I was normal, like, would I allow this? And it's just like the boyfriend coming over to hang out or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's like... Yeah, they, they've got this strange relationship that, that is very non-traditional. And it's funny because like. In, in the film, Ben Affleck and Anna de Armas are two very wealthy individuals, um, a, a story we've never seen put on screen, right? Two, two <laughs> affluent individuals having marriage problems. Uh, they uh, engage with a lot of their friends. There's a lot of scenes of them going to parties, hanging out with folks, right? Like, as, as I guess affluent rich people do right you know you just hang out like you're not really working so none of them really holds a job <laughs> yeah he, to be he, retired it, uh, yeah. and all their friends all their friends are, are very aware of of anada armis's infidelity in the relationship and his seeming seeming complete passe approach to it uh, and it's really weird and they tell him this throughout the movie and he is just the most like neutral toneless like took too many xanax like response to it like he just does not have there's nothing there's nothing there he's dead dead eyes yeah so so there's there are movies who do this kind of toxic couple thing r- really well uh, phantom thread is a good example uh, of that with daniel day lewis and vicky kreps and then also uh, more recently a uh, cold war uh from a couple of, of years ago which we reviewed on this show a- amazing film about the people passionately in love who should absolutely not be together um and i feel like it's kind of what they were going for but but none of it works like you never believe like that they're really in love or really crazy about each other they feel like a couple that should have been divorced five years before yeah and it's i feel like either i think it was her that was kind of like do you think i'm that stupid or something like i guess to divorce him or not divorce him yeah, they've they've got this weird like relationship where they seem to think 
I don't know. But being married isn't, isn't all this complicated. <laughs> like the, the the tagline for the film is is uh, you can see it on the poster. The love story is never the whole story, and it's like that's cute, but like the whole story is pretty dull, and like there's not really that much going on. It's not all that interesting with it. It's poorly written. Um, it's, it's like the, the, it's so boring. It's so like right. it's a full two hours. Yeah, it's funny. Like I really and I and I I gave the film too much credit at first. Uh, you know the, the, the this kind of opening this early scene that kind of kicks off uh this dark side of ben affleck's character and, and really gets our, our plot moving is, is when he threatens uh his wife's lover by saying that he killed the previous lover uh and and i thought affleck delivers it with so much ambiguity and like so almost emotionless that you can't tell if he's being serious or not and i thought that was intentional for the scene like the, the the other character can't get a real read on whether or not he's being he's being real or he's not. And I was like, ooh, this is interesting. He's almost like a like a snake in the grass, right? I like can't really see if there's danger there or not. You can't really tell. And then that keeps going for like the rest of the movie. And you come to find out like watching a protagonist who is complete, it's really hard to read all the time gets really dull. And like, you don't, that, that's not actually that exciting. Cause if you can't tell if they're being serious or not, you stop caring. And the movie's two hours long. Like it's a lot of movie for, to, to, to kind of try to figure out what the hell's going on. It, so, it takes about an hour about the midpoint of the film for anything even remotely exciting to happen. Yes. And then, as Andy pointed out, once that does happen, the writing eats itself and suddenly the world doesn't make sense anymore. And it's like, well, this this wouldn't happen this way. That's not that's not how rules. That's not how the world works. Like, yeah, it, so it's, it, it's a problem. At one point, one of one of their socialite friends suspects that uh, Vic is, is responsible for the disappearance of, uh, of one of the ex lovers. He hires a private eye. And, you know, it turns out that M Melinda also kind of suspects this and, and is actually kind of helping. The guy, I don't, I don't care about spoiling this movie at this point. Um, <laughs> easy, easy. You have people out but, there who might care, but uh, it, it just, it, it just devolves in into this kind of like weird who who done it, and it's again, this is the thriller part of it. Did this like, did he do it? Didn't he do it? We're gonna catch him uh, if he did, and uh, it's just not thrilling. You're, you like, you could care less about it. Yeah. Nin, thoughts on the thrills, chills? I mean, you, you had that gray line at the beginning. It's no, it's neither erotic nor a thriller, which is... Yeah, I really wasn't thrilled. Startlingly true. Yeah, right. I think the best acting was Trixie, the preschool daughter. <laughs> yeah, that scene of Anna, yeah, that scene of Anna to Armis, like, screaming at the daughter to turn off Old MacDonald had a farm is probably <laughs> the funniest in the whole movie. Um, Call it Sleepwater. Yeah. It's weird because like oh, with na you Anna a nap, nap Affleck yeah. Sleepwater, yeah, yeah. Ben Affleck is is rough, man. Uh, Anna Armas is good, but like you, you, the movie keeps her at arm's length the whole time because she is uh, kind of playing opposite Ben Affleck. Like these these two kind of torturing each other in this in this twisted relationship. Like she's not really who we're following. It's really supposed to be Ben Affleck, but even him we don't get to know very well. By the end of the movie, you just feel like okay, well these two people are both abhorrent. <laughs> no, there's yeah. nothing good about any of the either of them. Yeah. Uh, what a strange film to watch. I mean, it's not like in presentation. I don't think it's bad. I, I I'm not going to say it's a it's a terrible film. You could certainly do worse on streaming, but it's just dry like it's just dull you know like i i just don't feel like it's something i'd be easy easily quickly quick to recommend folks just because it's you know it's okay it's, it's, it's mid i watched uh fresh uh last week which was a small small horror film with uh sebastian stan and daisy edgar jones and that was a nice little film like you could tell it was like on a streaming budget but it, it was done well it was good story good acting good writing like it can be done it just wasn't done here yeah. yeah. There's a world where this works and this just isn't it. <laughs> I, all right. Well, and, come on, gang. Any other thoughts for recommendations? I think I'm ready. All right. Yeah. Andy, would you recommend Deep Water? Absolutely not. Hard pass. The hardest of passes. Uh, no, don't waste your time. I, I've had a few people tell me that they started it and they stopped at like 40 minutes in or so. They just could not get through it. Um, it's long. It's boring. It's not erotic or thrilling their relationship makes no sense the plot is all over the place like is it about the relationship is it about their relationship with their friends is it about whether or not ben affleck is, 
is you know making people disappear is about these stupid snails <laughs> like, <laughs> um yeah it, it's just it was so long and so boring i would not recommend this to anyone hard pass yeah i also wouldn't recommend this one ben? um I kind of just ended up watching it in the background while I was doing some work after a while. <laughs> Cause it just really felt like it wasn't going anywhere. Well, I do this thing where like, how long does it take me to get out my phone? I got 15 minutes into this before I got out <laughs> of my phone. It's just definitely like really slow to start. And just the whole movie doesn't really feel like you really went anywhere. Story wise. It is kind of just chaos. Yeah, I, I I'm in the same boat. It's it's not good. Uh, I I would say pass. Uh, if you wanted to watch something like this, I feel like there's, I guess the audience in my head for somebody who'd watch this would be like my parents, right? Like they 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 sit down one evening and they both have a, a, a glass of wine or whatever. Oh, so let's watch a movie. Okay, we'll pop on Hulu. Here we go. Two hours, Ben Affleck and an arm. It's great. It's right right up there on the front page. Right. That that's where you'll see. It. You'll click it. Yes. You'll watch it. It's like the and it's okay. Yeah, right. Exactly. And it like, I would say if you, if you see this and you think, Ooh, this looks interesting. I would immediately direct you to a handful of other features that do this better. Um, probably in either Adrian Lynn's former filmography uh, for movies like fatal attraction or, you know, stuff like Fincher. Yeah. I'd, I'd say go watch gone girl. It's going to be a much better movie, much more interesting. You will, you will be pulled in and you will be interested right up until just about the end. Um, I, I think if you're interested in, in this at all, Watch the first act. Watch the first about 35 minutes. And if, if you're into it, keep going. If you're not, you don't need to watch anymore. Yeah. Uh, it does help. I think the less you know, the better going in. But like I said, I, I, I it really does feel like a bit of a fluff piece. Like, yeah, this will be featured on the front of Hulu for a week. And then it'll slide to the back. And then nobody will ever talk about it again. Right. It'll just be a little, little, little B tier streaming movie. And that's okay. But for what we're doing here for bold cinema, not a pick. I'm going to say pass. You're not, you're not missing anything. And that's episode 170. We're already at the end. I, I, I can't believe it. Nin, thanks. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We're going to have to have you back, back again. Friend of the show. Like I said, Andy will send you a t shirt. And, uh, <laughs> And we'll we'll get we'll get those out as soon as we get our t-shirts you'll get one too don't worry perfect uh if you want to know more oh hold on andy what are we watching next week so uh next week is pretty big because the oscars are this week and they'll be on sunday evening at uh, seven central uh, so we'll be doing a big oscars recap and then we have a number of releases and we're only going to be watching one of these uh the big release big kind of mainstream one is the sandra bullock rom-com the Lost City, which also stars Channing Tatum. That's in theaters this weekend, March 25th. Uh, other big release that we're really looking forward to is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which is the, the new 824 film starring Michelle Yeoh, uh, which is about some sort of multiverse thing. It looks really cool and interesting, and that's what we're going to be watching for the show. Um, and then there's also, I wanted to mention this, uh, a film called Mass on Hulu comes out this weekend. It's about the aftermath of a uh, mass shooting uh, where the, the parents of victims meet with the parents of the uh, the shooter. And it's this like drama. And I've heard really good things about it. Oscar Isaacs. And it, that's out on Hulu this weekend just for your own edification. But we're going to be watching everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes, uh, very excited about this movie. Uh, it's a new film by Daniels, former directors of the directing team behind Swiss Army Man. They've not done a movie since in 2016. And that movie was surprisingly good if you haven't seen it. So I'd say maybe if you want to know what's going on here, maybe go check it out. But uh, definitely an odd trailer, really odd poster, everything ever all at once. Might be cool. Then have you seen, seen the trailer for that? Do you want to see that at all? I think Andy sent me the trailer. Mm, it's, definitely, it's definitely it's unique, but I I, I don't know. I'm hoping it's good. Swiss Army Man looked really weird on its surface, oh, and it turned out to have though. like a really, yeah, like a really thoughtful, sentimental heart to it. And like, I'm hoping this will have kind of that same thing. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, if you enjoyed the show today, if you like what we're doing here on Off Script, you want to keep up with us, maybe find out more. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, where we live stream the show every Tuesday at about five o'clock. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, where we upload our live streams. We're on Instagram or on Twitter, and you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartMedia, the usual places you find your podcast. Might even be where you're listening to us or watching us right now. Uh, if you are, the biggest thing you can do to help the show is just subscribe. 
Just scroll down and hit the subscribe button or up or over to the side. You know, wherever you subscribe on your platform of choice, I'm sure you know where you're at. All right. You, you seem like a responsible individual. You listen all the way through to the end of the show. So, you know, we'd appreciate it. You could also leave us a rating and review. That helps a ton for podcast stuff. Believe it or not, it, you wouldn't think it does. It actually does. We've done the research. We got the numbers in from the boys at the lab. And, uh, you know, write into the show. Email us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com. Let us know what you thought of these films or what's coming up. Oscar picks, Oscar predictions, Oscar snubs, maybe. And uh, visit our website at offscriptfilmreview.com. I think that's everything. Yep. Uh, from all of us at Offscript. Well, hold on. Nin, thanks again for joining us. I know I already thank yeah, you. Like, thanks for having me. Glory. Absolutely. You got to come. Oh, it's a good time. Be good. Uh, always a good time with, with the Oscar Group crew. Uh, from all of us at Oscar, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.